I'm Levi Morgan, and you're listening to the Manimal Mindset Podcast. Yeah, honestly, I was, um, you know, we went out to Leupold um, a couple weeks ago. How was it? Uh, Had you ever, you've been there before, I'm assuming. I've never been to Leupold, the Leupold place in Portland. Honestly, Portland was way better than I thought. Really? Dude, it was a pleasant surprise. You're on my wire, but it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> There, you're good. Uh, yeah, uh, Portland. Don't mind my Starbucks drink. Samantha got it for me because she drank my last Monster. On a huge health kick, I see. Big so, hey, that's the Venti's but vanilla sweet cream cold brew is only 170 calories. How much sugar is in it? Is the bigger question. It's how much. It's, I'm pretty sure it's aspartame. How much Portland is in it? Because you're kind of going pretty liberal here, <laughs> like pro Portland. Ever since just I casual went Starbucks. Starbucks. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's fine. next thing you know, I'm gonna have a bunch of signs and purple hair. I'm gonna be outside protesting. <laughs> <laughs> No, Portland, actually, I, like, we didn't go downtown, downtown, but, like, when we flew in, me and Andy uh, Morgan, who, not a fan of liberals by any means, um, we uh, <laughs> were expecting the worst after watching the news yeah. at all, and it was actually, like, a beautiful place. Mm. I still hear some pretty bad things about it, though. Yeah, it, I mean, I, I think it's where It's a at. centralized area, I think, you yeah. know, and that's, a, that's an interesting part for me, and I know you guys have traveled a lot, too. Man, it like we talked a little bit about the news earlier and yeah. how it kind of shapes how you think, how you feel. And it's so many times you you go to the source and it's like, ah, this this isn't as bad. You know, it's kind of like that uh, the video where it's kind of or the the meme where it's kind of framed into the burglar and the guy yeah. getting away. Yeah. When you scale when you scale out, it's like a totally different scenario. That's that's kind of been my feeling on a lot of things too, is there are bad things. There are right. terrible examples of Portland. But my experience in Portland, and this is all prior COVID, man, I don't know how that place could be terrible. You know, yeah. just just from what I experienced when I was out there earlier. Yeah, it's amazing, honestly. And I, that's why I hate the news. I just yeah. feel like all they folk, they'll make it look however they want it to look, mm-hmm. right? They want us to hate each other. They want us to hate everybody. They want everybody to be mad all the time. So I quit watching the news. Yeah. But Portland was awesome. Like, we went, uh, so back to Leupold, I, I was um, really impressed, man. Like, it was... Um, I've shot for Liverpool for a long time, but it was cool to see where your stuff's made, uh, see the team of people. And that's really for me, like where I can really get behind a company is when I meet the people, you know, and like they're great people. And so it was really cool to, to spend some time with them. And, uh, then we went and ate at this place. Um, gosh, the, uh, Oswego grill in Portland. And we're sitting there, and it's like the best food ever. Like, maybe we were hungry, but it was thick. And so, do you guys know Nate Simmons, the Western hunter? Yeah, yeah. His uncle owns the place. Like, how weird is that? Yeah. So, I text my buddy. I'm like, I'm eating Matt uh, Elliott, who does the online podcast with me and Andy. And he's like, where are you guys eating at? And uh, we were like, some Oswego Grill. He's like, you're kidding me. Nate Simmons' uncle owns that. So it was just, it was kind of a cool experience in Portland. So how did we get on Portland? Uh, We just drove in. I was going to say, let's back up. We just had Brandon on not too long ago. So we brought Brandon back. Yeah. Part two with Brandon. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're here today for is part two of Brandon. But we just drove, just jumped straight. He was feeling that Starbucks. Like, (laughs) dude came in and he's like, oh yeah, Yeah. Sam got me this, blah, blah, blah. That sucker was gone. Like. Not even, not even five minutes. That was under five minutes. Uh, it, yeah, I, I. Well, here's the thing. This is the time of day I'm normally drinking a bang or a monster. I haven't had my caffeine, so I needed it. <laughs> yeah, I'm flip flop today because uh, when I got rolling, it was so early. So I started with the monster oh, okay. gas station, and now I'm having coffee at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, lukewarm coffee out of the pot. Oh, it's dude. It's we call this uh, carpenter's coffee because it just builds over the day. <laughs> you never change the filter. You just keep adding grounds and reheat. Yeah, you know? there you go. Yeah, so. Yeah, a little different this time. Uh, so Brandon, Lily, we did part one. Kind of dove into some deep topics when, like, feel like it ended too soon. Wanted to do it again. And then we lifted today already. You killed my shoulders <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. Um, we've lifted together once before. Mm. Um so I guess what, you know, I get a ton of questions like, what are your lifts for archery specific stuff? And I've never really lifted that way. I just mm. lift kind of an all around build my whole body up, not specific, but I, like specific lifts. But obviously as an archer, you need your shoulders mm-hmm. and you need to protect them. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know, like today we kind of hit on that a little bit and you've like 
for anybody listening, I've went to Brandon for all my advice. And um, I just feel like what a no better person really to go to. If you don't follow Brandon, you should. Um, um, but, you know, anybody that missed the first podcast, world champion power lifter, just kind of all around expert, in my opinion, in that field of lifting and nutrition. And that's kind of what I want to dive into today a little bit more, I think. And, and uh, I'm sure you got a ton of questions for Brandon, too. Yeah. So. I'm just waiting. Well, we, but, st- we started in the truck a little bit, but just to qualify myself, you know, I, I was a power lifter for a long time, um, kind of arrogant and, and narrow minded in my thinking in that way, because much like you, you know, as a target archer, it could be very easy to alienate yourself from the hunting community or, or recurves or whatever, mm-hmm. rather than just trying to be a representative archer. You, right, you, yeah. can, you can get so specific to your thinking. And that's the way I was with powerlifting. Like if you didn't want to be big and strong, like what are you doing in the gym? <laughs> So, but again, that's kind of how I had to fuel my own, my own drive. So yeah, I, you know, I've worked with uh, division one football teams. I've worked with special forces, uh, domestic and foreign. And, you know, it's, it's been a career that I never imagined. I didn't even know it was a career, mm-hmm. you know, and it just kind of unfolded, but to your point, and it's awesome when this happens that somebody who is so good at what they do finds the right answer on their own. Mm-hmm. And even when we met and we started talking about things, I don't know if it was influence of really trying to target information that was accurate at the highest Mm -hmm. level, or if it was more like, okay, if I can get the attention of the people I really want to talk to with one specific thing, then I have their attention. Right. Um, And I want to help the archery community. You know, that's one of the things that I found a lot of when I went to the traditional side of shooting recurve, a lot of these guys are just talking about down pounding, Mm -hmm. you know, and like, well, I'm going to have to go to a compound and you know, it's like this, this mark of, you know, it's like a black mark on their, their heritage or whatever, because they wanted to commit to the stick bow and now they're changing course because of shoulder injuries, you know, people burn their shoulders out. So long way around to say, I was thinking very much in the line of, well, how can we strengthen this movement? Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's just a narrow minded thinking. You know, it was me trying to over answer the question and really solve the problem. Right. And if you get too specific, you're not actually doing yourself any favors because you're strengthening in one plane or one position. Mm -hmm. And that really diminishes strength in other planes or in other areas of movement. So what we did today was we started with three very simple band exercises. We just had an anchor with a band wrapped around it, and we used the squat rack. We had one hand on each end of the band, and we did just some face pulls, kind of just opening the shoulders up to the rear turned around and did those again to the front, like a peck fly or a cable crossover kind of movement. And then we put them under our feet and raised out to the side in a lateral raise. And that's really the three heads of movement. You're going to get a push, you're going to get a pull and you're going to get a raise. And then you can also do some, some down like eccentrics or concentrics where you're trying to like pull the, the weight into the body. But nevertheless, if we strengthen the whole mechanism of the movement, well, the movement's going to get better. Right. So today, you know, Joe and I were talking about different styles of training, different methods that I've used. And today for me was just a very specific, this is shoulder kind of in that wheelhouse of archery. We did some lats and triceps, bicep stuff, really just trying to strengthen the function of that movement and get it better. But every single exercise was different. You know, we, we bounced around quite a bit. We did different things. One, so I could show you a, a, you know, a plethora of different exercises, but two, so many people get wrapped up in the thinking of like, I've got to do four very specific sets of tricep press downs Mm -hmm. to get my triceps to grow. Well, your tricep doesn't have a brain, you know, it just responds to stimulus. So if I've found for a lot of people like today, we could have made it as boring and as long and drawn out as ever, because we could have gone one by one single file done every exercise the same. And it would have taken forever, but it was like, Hey, you and me, let's go. You two, let's go. And we just made it simple, fun. And we bounced around and we were done with one exercise, me and him moved on. And well, so, it was a lot like that when we were talking, I was telling you about, I was asking about Mike, the Mike Mincer thing. Well, and that's, that's been going viral across mine to where the whole philosophy is go in, you know, this dude was a bodybuilder, Mr. <laughs> was he a Mr. Olympia? Uh, he was Mr. He was second to yeah, Arnold, Arnold in 1980 yeah. and has the most controversial dude was of just all time. stacked. You should look at him. He's just stacked. But his philosophy was like, yeah, these guys are training too long. Like, I'm going to go in three or four days a week, work out for 30 minutes, and done. Well, you know, you understand this from a level of like, if I said, man, gun to head, you got to go out here and run five miles. You got to get there, I don't know, let's say in an hour. You got to get a 12-minute mile for five miles or I'm pulling the trigger. Man, you might not get there, but you're going to do something above and beyond of what your potential is, right? Right, yeah. 
And that's kind of his philosophy. Like if you can do something for 50 sets, how hard are you actually asking it to right, work? Yeah. So let's do one set where it, it's maybe I start with 135 on the bar. Never rack it after six or eight reps. You put 225 on there. I do some more. You do 315, and that's my work weight. And then I go until I completely fail. You give me some uh, some assisted reps. I do negatives. You help me stand all the way up. Then we strip it back down. So you got one set, 30, 25, 30 reps, just all out. But I, to my point, Mike Mincer was the first person that I found that I really, like when I read it, I was like, there's something to this. It makes more sense. Mm-hmm. Because his whole philosophy and the thing I told him, he said, if training more was better, we'd train 24 hours a day. Right. right. But you only you cannot grow a muscle as you're tearing it down. Right. So what do you do? Like you go in and you demand that I am going to push my body to a limit that's unimaginable. But I'm not going to go over that. And tomorrow I'm going to do a fraction more. Or, you know, not in tomorrow, but his philosophy was like two days a week, sometimes yeah. three days a week. Right. But for the most part, it was very restrictive. He wouldn't train the, the same body groups four or five days apart. You know, it would be very, very structured, way different than anything we see. And I said that worked for him because he was trying to only grow muscle. Mm-hmm. So people that are just clinging to this Mike Mincer protocol might not be the best thing. Training 12 hours a day is not the best right, thing yeah. either. So it's finding that happy medium of what you're going for. Is it strength? Because that's different than, than muscle growth, mm-hmm. you know. Muscle growth is a is a byproduct of the pursuit of strength, whereas I can make you big muscularly, probably by dropping the weights that you're accustomed to using now. Mm-hmm. You know, just getting more blood into the muscle. More. Please do well, <laughs> that, but that's <laughs> but that's the thing I tell people all the time. If I put 200 pounds on your back and I say you have one rep, but it's going to take five minutes, and you have to lower it for two and a half and stand up for two and a half, that's going to be a very challenging thing to mm-hmm. your body for one rep. Yeah. So that's kind of where the Mincer philosophy came in was like, let's extract as much as we can, as intensely as we can, so that when I come back in here, I'm I'm moving that needle forward one degree. Right. But so, it was always forward. Right. Whereas so many people, like I said, just to finish a point, when I got hurt, I was in the mode of more is more. And what happens is that people, a lot of times, they'll hit their stride right before the, the downfall. Mm. And that's what was happening to me because I was traveling so much. I was doing the seminars. And when I got hurt, I was trying to pack a week into four days. So it was, but it was working and things like that. Like I said, no matter what stimulus change you put on your body, you'll get a positive response. Mm -hmm. Most likely, like if you're doing the right things, it will be positive, but it's never positive forever. And at some point, especially when you're putting seven, 800 pounds on your back every week, five, 600 pounds in your hands every week to bench press and then seven, 800 pounds in your hands to deadlift, something is going to give at some point. Mm -hmm. Like you just can't keep adding weight forever. And unfortunately for me, I probably pushed into that climb zone a little too far. And then the downfall was actually on my competition day, like literally to break myself. So there is a catch point where too much is too much and too little is too little, but there's an apex point where it's a happy balance. And that to me is where we get individualized. Like, what do you need? What do you need? And those two things might be similar, but very specifically different. Would you say that, and this is a, a broad-based question just around fitness, for take take away maybe him and archery, if he, if he wasn't a professional archer, mm-hmm. like me and Clay, mm-hmm. just normal people and you, normal person. Oh, I'm an archer, by the way. Thank you. Not pr- Please refer to Sorry. Myself, please. No. <laughs> Sorry. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but would you think that the protocol would be more of like, a, I'll call it a bro split? Mm-hmm. Or do you think guys at our age, at our, our functionality is more of a full body conditioning, you know, three, four, five days a week, whatever it is. I know you said it's it's going to be individualized, but, but for a general probably yeah what would you look at so i kind of i'm going to refer to my friend greg walsh's philosophy and i'm going to butcher the exact quote but i'll give you the idea it's called the tiger inside right every single guy alive thinks man if this bad guy walked through the door man i whip his ass and this that and the other (laughs) well that tiger in the side is, is a liar you know like it it makes you believe that you're capable of a lot more than you think and when I was squatting 800 pounds, benching 600 pounds, and deadlifting 800 pounds, I could for sure promise you that if I could get my hands on you and inside of 30 seconds lay you down and squish you, I could probably kick your tail. If we went 31 seconds, I'm starting to lose that fight because I'm out of breath. And I think a lot of big guys, a lot of strong guys, or a lot of guys pursuing strength to overcome insecurity 
find themselves in a deficit when, you know, quote unquote, shit hits the fan because they're not actually good at what they're trying to be good at, which is being quote unquote, a man. They want to be the figure of health, the figure of strength, the father figure, somebody that looks and is capable, you know? So I think a lot of guys go too far to that spectrum. They think, okay, if I'm big and strong, then I got everything else in spades. Well, you know, you've mm-hmm. talked about gaining a little bit of weight and then trying to go out to the mountain. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a price to pay for those yeah. pounds. You know, ounces equal pound, pound equals pain. And that's what I think we need to get guys to understand is, is it better for me as a 35-year-old guy to be able to run, jump, get down in the floor, stand back up, put things over my head, put things down at a very, very effective level over and over and over again? Or is it better for me to be able to pick up a car once? Right. right. At 25 years old, at 30 years old, in pursuit of strength for whatever reason, competition or for physique or whatever, sure. At 35, I promise you, coming from someone who blew his knees and life apart at 32 in pursuit of strength, at 35, you're already on a downhill trend in most other areas of life. But in strength, most of the guys that are at the top, 37, 38, you kind of hit this weird maturity peak, right? But then what? What good? I mean, and I'm not trying mm-hmm. to down anybody, but what good is the 750-pound squat for a 50-year-old man if he can't get himself out of the floor or he can't even mm-hmm. put a coat or a shirt on? You know, I, I was that guy. Yeah. I was that guy. I had to have help to put a, like a suit coat on or my winter coat on because I was so big and restricted, I couldn't even move. Never ever thinking like, what if something happened that somebody needed me to move like that? or to get there and be able to stay there. Or just daily life functionality. Right? Exactly, and I think if you look at the injury rate of people, most people as they age, it's shoulders, mm-hmm. it's knees, it's hips. They fall, they can't get up. They're trying to put something overhead, it's too heavy, it falls back on them. So why aren't we training like that? And I know it sounds so silly, and if you're like, you had Ben Roethlisberger in here like telling him, hey man, let's just get you putting stuff on the laundry shelf. like. It sounds stupid, but if you look at the statistics of of what people age and the injuries that occur with age, it's all the stupid stuff, you know? So so getting people into the idea that generalized or expert generalism as a concept, that's when you're most effective because, hey, you want to go golf? Let's go golf. You want to go play baseball? Let's go play baseball. You want to go hike a mountain? Let's go hike a mountain. Being able to train so that you're good or at least capable of doing anything on Mm -hmm. demand that's the win. As you're 35, 40, 45, whatever, I don't, I don't know the payoff of much else focused yeah. in, the, in the gym. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at examples like, I mean, just Cam. Yeah. He's 56 years old. Mm-hmm. He's a beast, you know, but he doesn't train for how much he can lift. He trains for how long he can lift Yeah, and how long he can go. Endurance. Well, you know how ignorant it is to critique a guy for not lifting legs when he's outsmarted everybody because yeah. he his lift for his legs is the endurance. It's right, 13 yeah. miles a day. Like, what is lifting going to do other than prove to you that he's a man? Right. Like, he, go run a 13.1-mile run. Yeah, go run with him. You, know? <laughs> you, you don't think he's got legs. You know what I'm go saying? Go run up a mountain and, with and him. And you look at the guy, and it's like, what 56-year-old guy wouldn't want a physique of that caliber? Exactly. You know what I mean? So you might see a guy that's 60 years old and puffed up and, and jacked as hell. There's a lot of, there's a lot of work beyond just the, just the training and the diet. I mean, we talk about TRT and those kind of things. It's fantastic. But to me, a 60 year old person doesn't look like that. A 56 year old person can look like Cam. Mm-hmm. He may be on TRT. He may not. I don't know. But the point being, he doesn't look excessive if he is. Right. And that to me is when, TRT is at its best when it makes you a better by whatever marginal percentage, more like your old self, not like a version that you've mm-hmm. never been before. You know? So let's talk about your, your stance on like, well, I'm, I'm, and I'll use substances it. and all what that. is TRT? Testosterone pretty, replacement therapy. Okay. Test off tests. So. Yeah. So, or it's HRT is hormone replacement therapy is a little bit more accepted nowadays, but TRT testosterone replacement therapy. So through my competition, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, there's no testing for powerlifting. Mm-hmm. There, there are feds that do, but most wide open powerlifting does not. It's kind of like drag car racing. If you can build it and run it, yeah, go. And that's what we did. And my my endeavor was to, you know, I had a conversation with my dad. 
grandfather died at 73 his grand you know his dad died at 73 so it's like well i'm a competitive guy and i was killing myself with you know how big i was i was 345 pounds and you know i'd abuse myself with with anabolics and things like that so i needed to get healthy and my immediate stance was if all this was bad then i will just go cold turkey go straight and that's what i was doing just trying to go without trying to eat better trying to diet and all this other stuff and it worked i mean i did get better i did lose weight i did feel good but man it was just the the lethargic feeling or mm. the you know the mood swings of of like being a little bit aggressive and then it's like man why is this movie bothering me or this song bothering me you know i'm an emotional person anyway but like more than usual right. so i got to the talking to a doctor friend who had kind of followed my powerlifting, knew my injury, and he was like, I want to help you get better. And, dude, I, I, to be honest with you, now that mirror in that gym is magic. You know, it's got mm -hmm. that downlighting. But I'm looking at myself at 41, going to be 42 this year or next year, and, um, you know, I, I don't remind, remember a time, maybe that I was better, I do, but that I recognized, felt better, and was aware of how good I feel. Yeah. You know, and I'm 41 years old. I take 200 milligrams of test. I take a little bit of anti-estrogen every other day. And then I take HCG just to make sure that everything from a reproductive standpoint is balanced. It's not because I want a hundred more kids or anything like that, but it's, it's the idea of balance. What did you say that last one was? HCG. It's the human gr gonado, gonadotropin. It, it's, yeah. it basically uh, elicits a sperm response. It, it, so it helps you have it's like a clomid. It's like a fertility deal. Oh, so I don't need to take that. Correct. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> no more How do you take the uh, the estrogen? Is that a pill? The, is the that any a, estrogen? Is that is a, I just take a half a tablet. And the cool thing about that is, it uh, it does a really nice job of just combating what I was talking about to you, where testosterone falls quicker than your estrogen. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting an exogenous testosterone source in your body, your body is going to have to create estrogen to create balance. We like homeostasis in our body. It likes to level itself. Well, the testosterone is going to fall faster than the estrogen. So you're going to have residual, you know, estrogen is a, is a fatty kind of, uh, I can't even soluble. It's like yeah. a, so long story short, you're going to have some side effects when those things get too far out of balance. It's not like one mm -hmm. day is going to be the end of the world, but you can just start to see the further that you get from a balancing point, the more problems occur. And like I was telling him, side effects, you kind of have to think of a receptor as a cup. And once it's filled its cup or its capability to do what it's designed to receive, which would be like process testosterone as an injection and then help you with protein synthesis and things like that, that, that anabolics do. Once that cup is filled and, and doing its job to its capacity, then you have spillover. And mm -hmm. that's where you get side effects. Gotcha. So to me, the indicator was if I'm having a side effect result, Either I'm doing too much or I'm not creating that balance, that, that homeostasis point. So that's where the anti-estrogen comes in in a very, very small dose, just a couple times a week, just to make sure that by the time the next injection comes around, which is every four days, mm. um, you're kind of back to a leveling point. So you're always going to have waves, but if you scale out just a little bit and it's going to look more like an even line. Of yeah. Balance. With your TRT stuff, do you come off that cycle off or you no, stay on it? You know, and I've, I've talked to doctors about that. Um, my doctor, he's the kind of guy that's in shout out to foster medical in Lexington, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Like he has changed the course of my life. So, you know, there's a lot of doctors that will just do, like, we even talked about some conservative doctors that are like, uh, they won't even fancy the idea of giving a guy TRT. Like it's just right, out yeah. of the question. Right. Dr. Foster is the kind of guy that will absolutely inundate you with, information that you could never read comprehend or process but he will give you the information and the studies and things like that to back up what he's telling you to take and give you an informed opinion mm -hmm. and like it's never oh here's this cocktail list just take it like i said i want to go as light as i can possibly go if i could ever come off of it i would love if my body was optimized to the point that i don't need it I've taken less now over the years with Dr. Foster because my body needed more help. And as it's gotten better, I've been able to take less and get better result. But back to the mirror, mm -hmm. I was looking at it and I was like, man, I'm actually getting to a place that I'm really wanting to go. Right. And like consciously in all directions wanting to go. 
And I think that's what TRT has allowed me to, to be able to do is my body is just working as it's designed. You know, I'm not, I'm not setting any lifting records. I'm not setting any physique standards. I'm just better in every way than I was five years ago by a long shot, but even like six months ago, you know, and we're always doing blood work three to four, three to four times a year, which is super important. Anybody that's messing with their body at a high level, blood work is so good. I mean, just from so many levels, but there, you know, we just kind of evaluate and then we make changes as necessary. Sometimes it's a little more tests. Sometimes it's a little less. Sometimes it's a little more anti-estrogen. Sometimes it's a little less, but changes only happen or change. We can monitor changes very quickly. So like I even think about like from a cancer standpoint, you know, being able to have those blood tests just as feedback for where my body and my health is. Mm. I, I wish more guys would look at it and, and things like the baseball stuff and the NFL stuff really did a damage to guys being able to help themselves because of the stigmas and the taboo around it. I'm telling you, when it's done professionally, and I'm sure there, there are terrible examples of this, but when it's done professionally and it's done with somebody that understands and is living their life through TRT, like Dr. Foster, like he looks phenomenal and he doesn't look fake. He doesn't look like a Ken doll. He right, just yeah, looks... Yeah. He looks like a very healthy 60 year old man. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to work with him. That's why it's been great for me. Other people can go to the limit. Like if you want to go in there and you want to do growth hormone and peptides and those kind of things, I know that they help people. Like I've seen them help people. I encourage them. Like when, when you need them, when I've had injuries, TB 500 and BPC 157 are phenomenal for recovery of tendons and ligaments. So those are available. But for someone like Dr. Foster, he can take you to that point if you have the income and the desire. Or he can be like, no, if health is your ultimate goal, we'll go as narrow as we can. Mm. And that's what TRT becomes HRT because then that's hormone replacement therapy. And that's just a broader expansion into that world. Yeah, and you're you're injecting TRT. Yeah, so the testosterone, you can do – I mean, you can do patches. You can do gels. Listen, when I competed, everything that I read was intramuscular is the most viable – Yeah. pathway for for administration actually uh, i don't know the validity of this other than hearsay and cause and effect but the soviets apparently i mean they did studies on thousands Mm. of anabolically controlled athletes their belief was that the closer you injected to the spine the more neural response that you got to the muscle the bigger you got one change that we made and this is not an advertisement to do it but just honest anecdotal evidence I used to inject into my quads and my shoulders, mm-hmm. um, avoided the glutes because I would just not there for whatever reason. And yeah. a lot of people tell you to go there. When I started putting them in my lats, like flare my lat and then just kind of find the midpoint, nothing else changed. Our training didn't change. My diet didn't change. The best lifts of my life started on the heels of that change. And I don't know if there's any, like I said, I don't know if there's any cause and effect. I just was told that the Russians found there was a correlation to dang Russians. Yeah, no, I mean, well, listen, so the you've documentary got, Icarus. You should watch it. That's incredible, actually. But Icarus, you yeah. should, yeah. But it's one of those things where it's like, if you really get down to the to how the sausage is made, kind of, it's a mm-hmm. terrible thing the way that they operated the the communist athlete system. Yeah, we've learned a hell of a lot from it. Yeah, as far as medicine in general, as far as human performance in general, it's like. Yeah, it's an atrocity, but you have to take something mm-hmm. and not to make light of the bad, but there's a lot of things that we learn from this from a medical human performance standpoint. Like you just can't throw away the lives of those people just because it's an ugly thing to look at, you know? So I don't know. I think people just have a really bad misconception of it, but I, I encourage everyone to take a fresh look at it. Like if this was the flu and your body was out of balance to fight the flu, would you fix it? If your body's out of balance, not even of like, mood or appetite or body fat or anything like that your body is designed to be a man yeah and those things those hormones dictate your ability to be that organism at its optimum level i mean and everything in america is working against well that the the tap water i mean and and i'm not trying to go down a, a conspiracy rabbit hole there we we just know overwhelmingly from frogs switching genders to you look at the the demasculization of boys in, in mm-hmm. elementary schools. I mean, the, the gynecomastia is a real problem amongst mm-hmm. the youth and the boys. 
not every kid is overweight. Not every parent is feeding their kid junk food for that cause. Right. Maybe you have to just get honest. There's about several re river streams in America where there's like known sex changes in, yeah. in animals in so, that water. And there's, there's contamination coming into it from some of our stuff. That's why I think it's an interesting topic and probably not one for this podcast right now, but I think it's an interesting topic. You want to go down some conspiracy theory oh, right? hey, well, not, real quick? No, but I think we can't, we cannot villainize TRT because right. if this is something that we understand by no fault of these children, by no fault of their parents, something impacted their ability to be the organism they were designed mm -hmm. to be. TRT may not be a 50 year old man with money's option. It may be a medical necessity mm -hmm. at some point. So I think we need to get our, and again, that's not me propagating that or thinking it's the, the be all end all, but it is just a question that I ask of, of like, right. How beneficial can this be? And in what spectrum can it be beneficial if like all this stuff is really happening? Yeah. And so like, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty ignorant on all this stuff. Like I've never taken it cause I can't, you know, and, uh, but I'm, I want to, at some point, isn't that strange? Like it, it is strange. Like we, because we get drug tested and shooting, and we can't even take Flonase with you. So, right. like I can't take you know anything. Isn't like some that. of those deals with the heart rate and stuff. Yeah, beta blocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's all that, that stuff. Yeah. So, um, which, which sucks because I can't even look into it. like if I get a sinus problem or allergies, I'm like I gotta I gotta look into taking sinus medicine. You know, yeah. so, wild. Um, but I'm very curious. Like I. I I don't know what my test is, but like, what are signs of, I guess if for somebody is like of low test is it energy and yeah, I think so for me, you know, the body kind of works inside out mm -hmm. and I think people can look good for a lot longer than they feel good. Yeah. You know, so somewhere it's either going to be gastrointestinal stress or mental, uh, you know, kind of change in moods mm -hmm. definitely, which impacts sex drive definitely impacts like, testicular size or te te testicular, I guess, call it hang for lack of a better word. Like as your testosterone lowers, they start to draw up a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, there are physical signs that will come in time. But I think if you're really trying to be in tune with your body, some Hard of the work. emotional stuff, um, you know, maybe taking a little bit longer to get aroused than you should or can at all. Like those are, those are just indicators that as anxiety, a, depression, yeah, and, the brain fog, like there's so but, many, but think about things. this too. And it's, it's not a, it's not a knock on women, but it's an, it's more of a recognition of what estrogen is. If your testosterone is dropping and we just assessed or understood that testosterone falls faster than our estrogen. And now we're getting depressed and now we're getting anxiety and these things that are common with estrogen spikes around a period. Mm -hmm. If our estrogen is spiked, that's, moody that, that automatically thing. tells us that our testosterone is not at a balanced level right. if those are new characteristics yeah well i'll say i take it yeah and estrogen just, well, thanks for coming yeah, out so, so. thanks for coming yeah. out with that so estrogen's yeah. been life-changing for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> i hate both <laughs> no trt and it was like that was physically it did it, it's done great things and I, I love it and it's, it's helped me working out and being in shape and doing all these things but the mental side, my wife would agree with this too. Like the mental side of the anxiety, the mm. mood swings, mm -hmm. they'll just like stay in level all day instead of just like up and yeah. down and up and right, down yeah. has just been a game changer. Yeah. yeah I, I wonder, like I've never been checked. <clears throat> I wonder what, it, I mean, I feel like I have good energy moods, pretty normal, but here's I what got, I can tell you. I've got five friends since I started it. I've got three brother-in-laws and two friends that have all went and got checked and every single one of them have been low. Yeah. Like, well, I think everything is the, against us. Our cell phones, yeah. the American diet, the water we drink, our environment, shampoos, lotions, everything. It's just like yeah. against, like it's, it's destroying testosterone. And when I say low, I don't mean like, Oh, it was just low. So we got on Like they were down 300 and below. Yeah. Yeah. Which for a man that's not 50 years old, like, yeah, and I think one of the things that people don't realize too, I mean, if you want to just look at another little cause and effect point, some of the the byproduct waste of product or of plastics is estrogen specific. Like mm. it is chemically tied yeah. to an estrogen. So, um I just think that would make sense to me that from the drinking water alone, like if we just focused on that mm -hmm. topic and then again, like I said, the it's like 8,000 or 800 percent increase in gynecomastia in young boys what is that that's the soft breast tissue it's like oh. where they get like you know they man start boob. to develop like, you know man boob and, gotcha. and like seven and eight year old boys 
you know, like, and they're not fat kids mm-hmm. or, or heavier kids. And like, that was the stigma was like, Oh, he's just fat. So he's got man tits. Well, when you got a basically otherwise kid with abs and fairly lean, and now it's got breast tissue growing at seven years old. What, what is that? Right. You know? yeah. And it's like, it's just problematic. And it, I just don't know why they villainize the TRT so much in sport, you know, because yeah. you go, like we talked about it a little bit before you go to the Olympics, you see a guy run a 12 second hundred. It's like, what? Like, yeah. What do I pay for this for? You know, so the people, the same people that cheer root and want the highest of performance, like I said, they don't want to know how the sausage is made. Right. Yeah. yeah. There is not an Olympic athlete alive, whether they're on drugs or not. That is a, prime shining example of health and fitness right yeah. that is it is an extreme that most the average americans can't even comprehend mm-hmm. that's and that's why people go to those measures to to help themselves because you understand it your life is archery mm-hmm. you are the one percent of one percent of one percent accomplishments aside but to to have made a way and found a living through that mm-hmm. thing, most people are never going to do that so think about it you're a 20 year old kid at some university somewhere and it's like and if I can run a half a second faster, I'll make the Olympic team. A half a second faster. Mm. What are you going to be willing to do? And what are you going to be willing to do? And then you look at a baseball player. Hey, if you hit 12 home runs, we're going to pay you $4 million. Mm-hmm. You hit 20 home runs, we're going to pay $18 million. What? Yeah. Right. Like, what? Yeah. You know, and I'm not trying to encourage people to do it, but I am encouraging people to, to seek out TRT information. And I'm, I'm really hoping that these organizations understand you're just a man at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Like archery is what you do. Right, yeah. I would challenge that you might see at your level, might hold your bow a little more still. Yeah. I mean, like what is strength going to do for you at that point? Yeah. You, you know, from mm-hmm. that standpoint right. versus the benefit it would give you as a man. Yeah, 100%. If, if I'll go ahead and tell you and everybody listening, if, if I had the ability to do it and it wasn't tested against and I wouldn't fail drug tests and my whole career be... <laughs> uh, you know oh, just routinized oh, yeah. um i would already be looking into it i, I haven't went and got tested because i don't want to know i don't want it to get in my head if i'm low yeah. and be like oh, i'm half yeah. of a man you know or something <laughs> like that because i do feel good but i also know like, like talking to a lot of my close friends what it's done for them mm-hmm. right but what would you say like i feel like i've also had friends that got on it for the wrong reasons sure and way too young yeah. and did it the wrong way. Mm. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but I really want to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what would you say to that? Like what's, what is, what's the age? Is there an age or is it just case specific? I think it's case specific, but general, but generalizations is, seems to be around that 30 is at least the idea to start having the conversation. Mm. Anything before that, I mean, listen, you got you got athletes and stars across every spectrum that begin much younger. I did it much younger. And my answer to that would be if you're starting out younger, you're obviously starting with some incentive other than health. Right, yeah, yeah. It's for an aesthetic, it's for strength, mm. it's for sport, whatever it may be. I think in those realms of consciousness of thinking, you're in a chaos mode because why why are you needing this extreme mm-hmm. other than like self doubt or insecurity right. and that only comes from my own experience like i felt those things too so i would say just like if you're in a bad relationship or you have a bad job come away from it right. like just get away from it for a minute let your body clear out yeah. get to a point of its balance versus like influenced by by an exogenous drug kind of like i did and I, i'm not saying that's the best way to go about it cuz it had its hardships too like it's not withdrawals, but it is a clear recognition that like, oh, six weeks ago, I was much bigger, stronger, mm. harder, whatever. And now it's like, I feel like biscuit dough. Yeah. yeah. I have a buddy that really struggles with it. Yeah. Because he's on, off, on, off, on, off. Well, see, that was the argument for going on all the time. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I answered that earlier, but going on all the time, if you were healthy, as in a, a static testosterone, free testosterone, estrogen level, steady, you're not coming off. Right, yeah. But the the answer to why a lot of people need to cycle is because they stress so high. They go to those dosages that are oh, so hard. But at a level of like our cup, you mm-hmm. know, to go back to the receptor fill, if we stay on that low enough dose that's good enough for result, shouldn't see a lot of those problems. Yeah. But where I was coming off of like, you know, probably three, four 
and in some cases around competition time, probably five or six mm. X of what a therapy or like a TRT dose would be. Like, yeah. You know, I was superhuman because I put in superhuman effort, but the anabolics at a superhuman level facilitated some of the hum- superhuman effort. You know, people think it just gives you strength because you take it. Well, no, you have to lift and you have to eat. What it really does is help your recovery, your protein mm-hmm. synthesis, your tissue recovery. That doesn't grow and adapt if you're not stressing it. Mm-hmm. So that's why you see a lot of guys take it and they get fat because it's going to help you process that food faster too. And you're going to get hungry more and all those mm-hmm. other things. So it's not a, it's not a win at all costs kind of thing. Right. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's win with what you give back to it as well. Cause when I'm taking it, like, why would I take it if I'm not willing to lift to diet better? Like, it's just like taking a, it's just like taking a, a Tylenol for a hangover every morning. Mm-hmm. Like, just stop drinking and you won't have the headache, mm-hmm. you know? So it's kind of one of those things. It's, it's understanding where your body's at, what you've done to it. And that's by starting early, let's say. And for some people, if they don't go too high with it, they don't abuse it too long. They're fine. Yeah. Well, I think too diet's a huge piece. <sighs> Dude, but even if you take it or if you're taking things, or even if like, if your levels are low, like to be honest, like if you have low levels, well, what's your diet like? Yeah. Cause you might be able to shift that diet into a non-processed diet and jet it right back up. Here's the five questions that I ask my clients. One, are you even conscious of how you breathe? We talked about that out there, right? Are you even conscious of how you breathe? What's the one thing you can't go five minutes in this life without? Oxygen. Mm-hmm. Learn how to breathe. Like, get your stuff together. Water. How much water are you drinking? What are you eating? What supplements are you taking? How much sleep are you getting? Like, those kind of things. And if you can improve any one of those areas, TRT is not my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Exhaust your physical capability to do the things that are necessities for your body before we start adding in excess. Yeah. You know, so that would always be my encouragement. Get your breathing, get your hydration, get your sleep, get your nutrition, get your supplementation in order for six months. It's worth it. Like, Let's we, talk, talk about breathing. What do you mean by that? Because a lot of so, people I think are going to be like, what do you mean I can breathe? Well, a lot of people don't breathe well, and, and I am definitely not a breath expert. Um, Dr. Belissa <laughs> Branich, I've taken one of her breath courses, and it was phenomenal. She's mm-hmm. out in California. She works with Sorenex some. Um, uh, Brian Peters, he's a former NFL guy, does a lot of breath work. Uh, Mind Strong Project, they do a lot of breath work. But really what you're trying to do is avoid the high chest breathing you know, the, the fight or flight type breathing when you're yep. panicked. And I, we were talking about how little babies walk, you know, mm-hmm. Joe was trying to suck his gut in, look pretty. And, uh, <laughs> I kept telling him to, uh, you know what? You confide in people one time. In the <laughs> well, I'm mad cause you took your damn shirt up and you look better than I did. So I was like, what the hell? But, uh, long story short, you know, I was telling him like babies get it right. Yeah. They got that little pooch belly uh-huh. cause, and you watch them, they breathe through their belly button. Yeah. You know, because they're diaphragmatically breathing, and that just lowers your stress level like so much. It changes the way that your brain responds to breath. It You're changes. trying to breathe through your belly button right now. I am, yes, I am. You can't <laughs> not listen to that and not try it. But one of the one of the ways to do that is just I do it when I'm driving. There's okay. a lot of times I'll just kind of sit up straight as I can and put my hand right here, and in through the nose, out through I'm the mouth. Try it. In through the nose, out through the mouth. It just. Oh, it's totally different. Yeah, because you're doing it too. The camera guys do. <laughs> but honestly, uh, even even Huberman talked about it. It was something along the lines of five successive deep breaths to like capacity through the nose, with slow exhales through the stomach or through the mouth into the stomach. That is a natural. Like you will feel an immediate stress release. Dude, that's totally different. Yeah, like you normally like for me, I feel like I just keep it like tight. Yeah, all the time. It's just like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, on an, that's an extreme level, but I well, that's like- but that's where you're in that. Uh, and again, there's there's different terminology and some some understanding of these things, but that's when you're kind of in that flight or flight. I bet your HRV is horrible. Yeah, what is like that is it a car? Variability. No, when yeah. you're sleeping, it's your oh, it's the, the variability, variability between of- the heartbeat. Oh, so it's I see. like doom 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 doom. That time in between it. Yeah, uh, to his point, like if it's if it's super low, that means you're in a flight mode, which means you're high stressed, you're, you're yeah. tight wound. And if it's really high, that's a sign that your body handles stress well, and it's just like it's chilling out. Yeah, and you're calmed down. So when I'm shooting, I automatically my breathing slows. So I almost feel like when I get nervous, I probably do better. Well, that's what I was gonna say too. Is a lot of times, 
especially guys who are stress adapted, Mm -hmm. you know, like you look at a Navy SEAL or some of those guys, they do the HRV values on them when they're, when they're working. And, you know, this guy can be sitting here listening to the pre, like the pre orders and he's Mm -hmm. getting his stuff and he's getting amped. He's like, I'm going to go split some heads, you know, like Mm -hmm. he's getting fired up. And then when he gets out there on the battlefield, you know, it almost looks like he's falling asleep. Right. Yeah. You know, because that's his wheelhouse where it's like, He's no longer in fight or flight. That was over here mm. where he was in control of himself or like out of control of right, his thinking. Yeah. You know, it was like that excitement. But in here, how many rounds has he done with somebody screaming in his face, do mm-hmm. it this way? So now he's on autopilot. Yeah. And his stuff is coming back down into the place where he's comfortable, even though it's like, what is going on? Here? This is a war zone. Yeah. That's where his symphony starts. You know, he right. starts finding himself in his groove. Same thing for you. I've watched you shoot enough that – I watch other guys and they're breathing like this when they're at full draw. I won't say the guy's name, but he was at full draw and he was, he was doing like kind of this number. Mm -hmm. And I thought his bow and I was watching his bow and then I was watching him breathe and you could see him. He was holding, holding and he had to let down. Yeah. You know? And it's like, well, hell yeah, that's going to feel like the whole world's moving. If Mm -hmm. you're breathing up here, even if you can get back here and breathe through your stomach, you know, it's moving a little bit, but it's far, far less than that. And I think if you were in a full shot and it's maybe long, I don't know if you'd want to breathe, let down or what, but I think you might be able to salvage your aim through the stomach rather than through the top. I'm sitting here just thinking because the only, like when I've just felt that breathing through the stomach, the only other time I remember feeling that is when I'm super nervous. And I think it's just something I accidentally do Mm. to calm myself down. Mm -hmm. Like whenever everything gets hectic and it's like, you know you're about to have to make a shot for the worlds or for the classic. That's the only time I feel myself do that. And it's just like this, maybe I just got lucky. I don't know. Well, I think you've been in enough high stress situations. You've probably just learned like your body is just like, just like, uh, you can live on less food over time, mm-hmm. you know, because you adapt. Yeah. Well, I think with stress man, your body probably just found a way where it was like at the rev yeah. limit, like I got to do something yeah. to help this dude come down. Well, you didn't know how to do it, right? but it showed you how to do it. Yeah, it did. And it. you'd never connected the thought with Mm-mm. the thing. but That's weird because when I just felt that, I was like, oh, God, I feel like I'm in a shoot-off. <laughs> <laughs> but watch your baby sleep. That's exactly Oh, yeah. Well, you even watch Allie run around. She's yeah. just like got a little gut pooched out, you know? But, man, you, you watch them when they're sleeping, and that's all it is. It's just that belly moves. That Nothing else moves. Yeah. Just their belly. And we get away from that because we try to suck into her pants or we try to fit yeah. in the suit. And it's like... There's, there's a lot of things anatomically that we're doing, whether it's our shoes with too high of a heel. I mean, we're, we're really putting some weird stress on our bodies, hmm. yeah. you know, in weird ways that you wouldn't think about. So have you bought into the, the cold, hot exposure stuff? Again, you know, my introduction to, uh, to sauna was actually in Finland. It's like the, the origins, you know, Scandinavia and, um, wasn't really doing the cold plunge stuff at that point yet, but this was back when I was still powerlifting. So I'll go into this sauna and these guys, I mean, they're about it. Like it's part of their culture. It's, it's a real thing over there, you know? So I walk in and there's a big sign. It's like uh, nude only, no towels, whatever. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I got enough stones to hang in Finland here. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I go to really the, in well, that's what, <laughs> pun intended. And, uh, <laughs> especially walking into a room full of strangers. Uh, anyway, I walk in there and I've got my towel on and stuff and, this old guy like geezered out, you know, he's sitting in the corner and he's just got the steam and he's, or he's got the water in his spoon and he's like, and it is, I mean, this place, you thought it was hot in the gym today, man, that sauna, I was like suffocating. I couldn't breathe. He said, how do you expect us to accept you if you can't even accept yourself? That's deep. And I was like, (laughs) All right. Hey, man, screw you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to the bathroom. He takes his towel off. They start popping him with theirs. <laughs> no, nah, so that was that, that was what you told me about. <laughs> uh, no, nah, so anyway, you know, aside from, you know, just having the, the feeling of like, this is strange, I took the towel off, and it was like, it was a very different thing for a, a multitude of reasons. So this dude talked to me about the benefit of sauna forever. And he was like, do you feel better about yourself now? Do you feel do you feel good naked? He's like, because that's who you are. He's like, if you're afraid to see yourself naked, you will never see a life you want because you can't even imagine yourself in it. He's like, if you can't even see yourself in the mirror for what you are, you'll never actualize the life you want because you can't dream. 
Like you can't dream yourself into a life if you huh. can't see yourself. So I'm like, sauna's awesome, you know. And uh, but it was it was a very cool introduction because that was the intro there. But I was with a group of guys, and it was like we would go from the sauna to this room. You know, you got a robe on. You go in there and you have cheese or meats and beers and all this other stuff. And it was like a full Sunday. You know, it's just waves of sauna. And then finally towards the end, we started doing the, the cold showers and the ice bath and stuff. And it was like I felt so high, you know, from both of that experience because the room was so hot. It was it was unbearable in a way I can't even comprehend, like telling you guys how to feel it. And then the cold was so extreme, but it was so much better because it was relief from the hot. Mm-hmm. And it was like, even when it's terrible, the extremes complement one another. Like, you need that extreme cold if you've had ex- that extreme heat. And when you're freezing, you want the extreme hot. So it's like you go from hating something to wanting something. And I don't know what that does to your psychology or your mental strength, but it's weird to want something that you just hated five minutes ago. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think it just it does something on a weird level. But physiologically, there's no denying that there's benefit. I just think people have gone crazy with it because it's easy content. Mm-hmm. You know, it is beneficial in a way that I think every athlete can employ it because it's free. Yeah. Don't go spend $2,000 on a stupid ice bath. Go p- spend two bucks at the gas station. You got a bathtub, you know. Get yeah. ice, yeah. So I, I just don't think that people need to go to like revolution, like making their whole world about an ice bath mm-hmm. or a sauna, but going to Finland where it was a culture that is steeped in the history of sauna. Yeah. It was a great place and it was a great experience. And I, I value sauna because of that experience. But I'll go through spells where I'll hit it two or three times a week and then I'll go three months and never go. Mm. And I've gotten better without it. I, I think there's benefit to it, but it's not something I'm married to and it's not something I tell people to spend their money on yeah. if they haven't even taken care of their food. Yeah, well, that was one of the reasons I never did it, I'm just because it was everybody was doing it. Dude, I'm the same way. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Screw the ice bath because it was everywhere you look. Yeah, yeah. I, I won't I, lie. I bought a hundred dollar stock tank. Hundred hundred dollars. <laughs> well, no, no, oh, yeah, from Tractor Supply. That's, a, that's supply, a great so option too. Yeah. For that's, sure, that's a great option too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it it solves the problem and it's not yeah. commercial. Well, yeah. Grizzly sent me that giant cooler they have. It's perfect for it, and I just have refused to do it. We're doing one today. If I do it, I'm not documenting it. No, we're doing one today. <laughs> After this I'll podcast, die, we're dude. doing it. We're all going to do it. That's what we're going to do. We're well, doing we'll it. see how that goes. i got to spend some time with my kids. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Landon, I guarantee Landon, oh, Landon and Jax will, do will both do it. Yeah, they'll do it. Yeah. They'll do it. That, that's interesting. I've always wondered that, though, about the, the, the sauna definitely is something I would – I think that's – I see more benefits there, the sweating and the – you know that stuff, but I guess so my my wife is a researcher. Yeah, and so she's like skeptical of this ice bath stuff about some health things too. Andrew Huberman says it's good. It has to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know who that is. Whoa, who's Andrew? Who? He's got a he's he's one of Rogan's guys. Got, oh. he's got a he's a PhD. He's a he's a lecturer, kind of researcher. Yeah. He's he, really he's sharp. Yeah, I mean. Everything I've heard the guy kind of espouse is is either in the realm of thinking that I'm mm. already on or like it enlightens me to more yeah. depth. But seemingly level headed guy. I think in any of this stuff, I mean just training, shooting, health, saunas, ice bath, TRT, I feel like if you really truly believe in it, it's definitely gonna have a benefit for you, mm. right? You mean like a placebo type deal? <clears throat> like if- yeah, you know, well, even the more you believe and are invested in what you're doing, I just feel like the more it's actually going to help you. Well, that's I made a post about this the other day, and it really does tie into that because just a few days ago I posted a video of myself shooting with the recurve. And in spite of myself, I have shot better than I am technically shooting, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. My equipment was built, tuned, and told to me exactly how to make it shoot great. Mm-hmm. I've overcome technical deficiencies because the equipment was so good. Had a guy give me the same advice that 500 other people have told me in regards to the way I shoot and my Mm -hmm. release and everything. But he told me in a way that I could see it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm changing it tomorrow. And I did. And that's a belief foundation. And I've talked about it from the standpoint of, man, if you came to me and I wrote you the perfect workout, like the perfect workout, and you look at it and it looks like Hebrew, Mm -hmm. you're out. You know, like you don't know what to believe. You don't know why it matters. You don't have any buy-in. 
But if I can sit down and be like, Levi, you know, think about the biggest tournament of your life. Think about what you did really, really well. That This is going to support that. Here's some things that you've struggled with and you've told me you don't feel good about. These are going to figure that out. And then all of a sudden you've got, oh, I can connect the dots here. I can see why mm -hmm. I need this exercise or I can see why I need this plan. The, res well, I think, I think the result becomes totally different it, because it doesn't matter if they can comprehend what you write or if they can't. They will not at a cellular level enthusiastically do anything that they don't believe in as well and efficiently as something that they do I at a cellular the level. Black and white things is diet. And mm -hmm. that's what I've found over mm -hmm. the last couple of years. Like I used to try and, and do like diets and they'd be stupid crash diets or like, Hey, I'm going to do this mm -hmm. for this long. And you always fall. You've always yeah. fail and do that to where once uh, I was telling you to do carnivore mm -hmm. where now it's like 80, 20 or 90, 10 mm -hmm. to where I still, if it's a weekend, which one is it? 80, 20, or 90, 10. As long as I'm within there, I'm 85, good. 15 at any time. Yeah. Okay. You know what okay. I mean? I see. A hundred percent of the time, 80% of the time is what I'm doing. Okay. Mm. So uh, you're on one today. I was just asking. <laughs> I, I wanted to know just where to we clarify, stood. Well, yours is zero, so it's better than you. <laughs> but um, once I started doing that, and it was like, oh, I want a piece of cake. Well, I have a piece of cake. Yeah. And it's like, okay. I broke it down. You said weekly. Yeah. I did that with like, I can have two meals a week. Yeah. That I can eat whatever I want. Mm. And if I don't want to do a whole meal... And I want to have five snacks a night that equate to that meal. Right. Yeah. Then that's what I want, and that's it's helped me so much because now it's not like getting a cake, and it's like I'm a, I'm a crackhead. Where it's like, I, there's my carbs. I'm back right. on it now. To where it's like, okay, back to my normal train. Well, and that's what I was telling my buddy the other day. We were talking about kind of the weekly model, and you know, just imagine you have three thousand calories a day as an intake. You got twenty one thousand calories for the week. Now, somebody who's standing on a bodybuilding stage can't follow this advice, but somebody who's fat as hell and can't get off the couch can start here. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But for me, I, you know, I have you know, continued to improve and find new progress doing this exactly. And I just had another person corroborate that it was working for him. He's lost 32 pounds in like four or five months. Mm. So what I do is I typically enjoy myself Friday and Saturday or Friday and Sunday or, you know, mm -hmm. a couple days a week, I want the freedom and flexibility to have a couple beers or a bourbon or a big fat cheeseburger or a few pieces of pizza, right? So I've kind of rough ball what that is. And then I subtract that from my 21,000 and then I just evenly disperse the calories over the rest of the seven days. So it's like, I need to have this every single day. And then on Friday or Saturday or Sunday or whatever, I can have two beers. I can have a cheeseburger of this many calories. Don't get the fries, whatever. Like I build my parachute in there, like my safety net to where the steam, there's like a pressure release valve, mm -hmm. right? Like I can get super, super detailed to the point where I will do damage to myself from a discipline level because I will over diet. Yeah. So having those planned, like this is where the pressure release valve mm -hmm. is. Just make it to Friday, get your meals in, make it to Friday or it's like, man, I want to go ham. It's somebody's birthday and we're going out and we're eating food and we're getting wild, whatever. Like if that's, if that's your story and that's what you want to do. All right. I know if I walk a mile, it burns this many calories. I know if I do a 30 minute, whatever, it burns this many calories, just choose one. You know, you can add calories too, you know, by doing extra work or extra workouts. Like that's something I do. If I'm going to go out and I know that I'm going to have a few beers or I'm going to eat really wild. Like have a challenge day, go out and do something crazy, burn six, 800 calories in a mm -hmm. workout. Then it's a celebration, not guilt. You right. Know? Yeah. And I just think that for me has worked really well, trying to make it a week long system, work those calories in there to where it makes sense. Kind of a lot for a Friday or Saturday cheat meal or cheat weekend kind of thing. And then just reduce the calories per day across the seven. Well, the other thing I heard that made a lot of sense was, um, just move, move more. Don't eat less. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's so mm. if you think about it in that term, like it's so much easier to get up and walk around mm. or to go do push-ups or do something like that rather than being like, no, nah, I'm not going to My favorite it. is when you start helping a client who is starving themselves and they're literally eating three times as much food that, that they ever believed they could and then they start losing weight. Yeah, that's the thing that most people don't understand. Yeah. Like, when you're really working hard at, at that goal of being in the best shape you can be in, you eat a lot. Oh, yeah, you have to. You have to. Yeah. yeah. And the, the volume of the food gets to be cumbersome too. It's it like, is. You tell somebody, all right, 200 grams of protein. That's so, tough to do. That sounds that sounds like, oh, I can get that. You know, guys get it all the time. 
Well, let me just tell you right now, that's two pounds of meat mm. a day. Yeah. Every day. Or it's, you know, six eggs and a pound and a half of meat. Or it's, a, yeah. you know, two protein scoops with six eggs and then a pound of meat. If people would track what they eat on a daily basis from, like, carbs, fats, and proteins and, and total calories, I feel like it would blow their mind. I think oh, yeah, yeah. if people would just learn that eight ounces of a meat is roughly 50 grams of protein, if they would learn that a cup of rice is 300 calories, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like just eat the basics and understand the basics, walk before, or, you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run mm -hmm. kind of thing. Give yourself a week to build your diet. Give yourself very basic foods to build your diet. And one thing, man, that I don't understand there's so many zero calorie sauces and seasonings yeah. out there now, like that are phenomenal, mm. like really, really good. And it's like, what? Well, everything I eat tastes bad. Should I? Nothing I eat tastes bad. Yeah. Like I don't put bad tasting food in my mouth and I eat pretty clean. Yeah. You know, so that's something else too. And you just, it's just effort and discipline though. You know, how do you get somebody who's let themselves get to a certain point? They can't change it all at once. Like it's, how, it's, it's like discipline overload, right? How did you do it? What's that? Well, once you hit rock bottom, how did you turn the ship around? Well, I got to be honest with you, man. Uh, <laughs> You're still there. I was in a low place. I'm, I mean, comparatively speaking, I'm a lot higher, but probably still real low. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still digging out. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, honestly. The, the rocks God, right over there in the hard places. But see, what, what a lot of people don't understand, though, is like my health journey has not like I was in terrible shape for a while. You know, I was an athlete in high school and I was in great shape, graduated same exact size and weight I am now, 6'4", 220. But after that, when I started shooting for a living, traveling all the time, not in the gym, I got 265. Yeah. Dang. Not muscle. I was a big old boy. <laughs> like people were poking my belly like, looks like you've been eating good. I'll never forget, like, my buddy, Garrett Ayersman's mom, Mary, they run the archery shop, um, Sportsman's Refuge. We're at ATA. I had lost from 260 to about 250, 245, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Still fat. She walks up to me at ATA, and I'm thinking, like, I'm doing good. And she pokes me in the belly. Boink! And, like, soft belly. She's like, looks like you've been eating good. And I had lost, like, 15 pounds, and I was like, that's it. Like, that's it. And that was like, that was when I was like, I'm done. Right. Yeah. And that's when I like Blake Kidder. I don't know if you know Blake, mm -hmm. um, but Blake shoots and I called Blake because he, he competes in CrossFit and he was like my guy back then. And I was like, hey, man, I'm sick of this. Like, and I'm the type of person that needs to believe in something. I need to know I'm doing it the right way. And I could like working out, fitness, health, nutrition was not my lane. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, draw me something up. Like I'm tired of it. And I was like, went from 260 to 196 in four months. Like when I finally decide to do something, I'm an extremist and I'm like, that's it. Like I, and then I got in so deep that everybody thought I had cancer <laughs> because I looked like so skinny, yeah. you know? And so then like, I've had to find that balance. Where do I feel good? Where do I feel strong? Cause I want to feel strong. I love to lift. Like yeah. I love it. I hate cardio with a passion. Mm -hmm. Same. Ran eight miles with Cam the other day. Almost died. Legit. I was like trying, and he was running up a mountain having a full blown conversation with me. And I running couldn't Running up, coming back. Yeah. Probably. I was like, <laughs> like the thing you see on the reels. I was <laughs> when you forget fine. to turn the audio up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so it's just been a real long bad. And I did keto for 12 weeks and got in the best shape of my life with, with Bomar. Yeah. And he put me on his thing, and then my digestive system completely shut down, almost died. <laughs> yeah. like, because when I do something, I'm like to the extreme, no balance, and that drives Samantha insane. Because I'll eat so clean and so perfect, no, no sauce. I don't want anything on it, plain chicken, whatever. And that I was doing no carbs in, and it was every two weeks when I was on that, I could have a cheap meal, not a day, yeah, one meal. So it was like IHOP, yeah. pancakes, let's go, you know? And so, but it was like, we were doing 40 minutes of cardio to start the day. And I mean, I got shredded, but then eventually, like, I needed those cars. Like, my body needed that car. Like, it was not a good balance for me, right? Yeah, well, that's just where aesthetic, you know, 
like I said, the Mr. Olympia guys or even just, you know, casual fitness people that are, let's just say beyond that 8% body fat. Like mm-hmm. once you start getting sub that, mm-hmm. man, you're, you're really borderline on calling yourself healthy. Like yeah. That's, that's just a very, very odd statement because mm-hmm. there's nothing about that process at that point that's healthy. Yeah. You know, like you saw someone in that conditioning on the street in a foreign country you would offer them food. Yeah. You know, like, that's where people were at with me. They were like, Hey man, yeah. get me off to the side. Like you, everything. Did you, hey, we're praying for you. Bes- I'm, like, I'm fine. I, <laughs> I did this on purpose. And they're like, yeah, besides yeah, that, we know, po- we know you're fine. Besides <laughs> that moment, did you have a point when you looked at yourself in the mirror and were like, Oh God, like what have I done to myself? Like when I got too skinny or, or, or too like, big, when I was too big for sure. Yeah. That was me. Um, so I'd had, I'd had some surgeries you know, I competed at my best around 325. That was kind of like my strongest. Mm-hmm. And then after I started getting in my subsequent surgeries, it was like, you know, mass moves mass. So mm-hmm. it became 330, but the five pounds of difference wasn't more muscle. It was more fat right. and so on and so forth up to 348. So Golly. 20, dude, I was 348. I mean, I graduated or I was in high school. How tall are you? Well, I thought I was 6'3 until I saw that picture. And you said you're Mm 6'4. Ben's seven and a half feet tall. (laughs) So I don't know. I'm 5'11, 5'8, somewhere in that range. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But anyway, no, I'm really, I mean, my driver's license says 6'2. So, okay. Um, But yeah, you know, I can can remember when, you know, it was a couple surgeries in after I'd kind of hit that that peak of weight. Mm -hmm. And the body composition was just different. Yeah. Like it was the same number on the scale, but man, those big round shoulders that had been strong mm. were now like saggy fat shoulders, you know? Yeah. And like, dude, I, I remember it was like, I was just in the bathroom and like on the side of the, the shower there and I had a brace on my knee and I could see myself in the mirror and I, I didn't even rec- like, I thought it was somebody else in mm-hmm. the house. I was like, Oh my God, what have I like? Yeah, literally. Oh, what have sure. I done to myself? I had, yeah. a, I had the same thing. My grandmother would go to the beach every year, and my wife will laugh when she hears this because she we we laughed at me and mm-hmm. together. So we're sitting there. My grandmother. We go to the beach every year with my whole family. Well, my grandmother decided to make like a, a photo book for everybody. Well, I'm I'm on the cover of it with my with my son, and I'm sitting in this chair. And I'll never forget. Like I I, I get it, and I'm looking at it, and my wife kind of like has this little crap eating grin on his face <laughs> and i'm like because she's looking at me and i'm like oh my god and she's like what and i was like it looks like i've got bags of sugar for tits and i'm like hunched over in this seat and it's just like everything is sagging my stomach is out and i was just that was i was like i'm done i'm yeah. too fat i look disgusting it's embarrassing i think that's good though like yeah. you know I, our country has this thing with like fat shaming I, i'm glad that that mary poked me in the belly yeah I, I want people to call me out. Yeah. It's not good to be fat. No, like there's, there's that no. makes no mistake about it. It's unhealthy. It's not good. It's not. Yes, and it's not easy for everybody. But like I was fat my whole life before sports, right? As the kid, I looked like a little Brock. Lesnar. I wore husky size. Me too, huskies. Yeah, huskies. Bugle huskies. boy, huskies. Son. That's right. Yeah, dude. <laughs> like I was chubby, and always the kid. I didn't want to take my shirt off. I was ashamed of the way I looked, embarrassed. My sister called me fat every day of my life. Man is a saint now. I love her to death. But when we were kids, she tortured me. Like, you're fat, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> that was my life. Like, we go to Ryan's Steakhouse after church on Sundays. Ooh. I got eight plates. Yes. And my sister would beg my parents to make me stop. Did you grow up eating Ryan's? <laughs> Dude, Golden Corral, Ryan's. Absolutely. But Western Quincy's. Sizzling. Y'all remember Quincy's? Yeah, Western, Western Sizzling. Western Sizzling. Western Sizzling. Come on. Yeah. Our Western Sizzling just got shut down for hepatitis B. Oh, but, good. You know. Oh, that's uh, disappointing. Did you, you guys make bomb steaks? Did you guys ever hear of a Columbia's? Uh-uh. The Columbia Steakhouse? Yeah, we had that one. And then we had Cliff Hagen's. He was a basketball player at UK. He had a steakhouse in my town. Clay, did you guys have Ryan's? You ever heard of that? No, we had Western Sizzling. I got I got okay. stopped at Orion's uh, from eating all you can eat steak when I was a thrower in college, you know, because we uh <laughs> we ended up you know because <laughs> hey 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 somebody go get him well, Some, yeah it, it was one of those it was one him. of those deals you know how they like when it's all you can eat steak night they barely cut you a slice uh-huh. you know oh, yeah. so I was the guy that was like I mean I'm a thrower more yeah. and I was like okay just save you and me some time like just go ahead and give me some more like well, I can only give two well okay. So I just picked up another plate and I was like that and I dumped it. I just kept dumping it on the plate and I was like, it's a fresh plate, it's a fresh plate. 
So finally, you know, I did two or three rounds of that and it was probably, it had been all day since I'd eaten. Um, I'm going to say it was probably near a pound and a half, two pounds in one sitting of, of sirloin steak. Right. And I'm just trotting my way back up there. Me and John Hawkersmith, I got some beef stroganoff and then I wanted more steak on top of the beef stroganoff and I was going to go back and eat it. You don't know anyone named John Hawkersmith. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that brother's quote. Oh Come yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've always, I've always laughed about that because that was, that's his actual name. But anyhow, <laughs> um, it, it, they, the manager comes over to me and he said, "Sir, you cannot combine those two items. You can't add steak to the beef stroganoff." And I was like, "What?" And he said, "Yeah, it's a violation of our policy. You can't have any more steak." And I said, "Really?" And my coach was like, "You're telling me that a meal that I've already paid for and my athlete can't eat? Round them up." So that was my last Ryan's. It's a real speech. Applebee's I, has dang. rats moment. Well, I boycotted. I boycotted room. Ryan's after that. I never ate it once. Dang. Since. That was two thousand three. We used to go all the time. Two. My favorite meal was the soft serve ice cream with Dude. the ham. I mean, it was unbelievable. The dessert bar at Ryan's. It was it, unmatched to this. Unmatched. Thing. They had brownies, ice cream, all the toppings, strawberry, chocolate. Mm, I mean, gummy it, bears. Gummy. I mean, it was yeah. like. What about a pizza salad bar? Do you remember that? Oh, it was the best, dude. Shoney's? Shoney's, Shoney's salad Shoney's. bar? Yeah. The Shoney's. That ranch uh, dressing is off the charts. Yeah, their chocolate sundaes at Shoney's. Or Shoney's. Dude. Mm. Hey. What's the place you got to stop at every time you, if you pass it? Like, is, do you have a, a like a chain spot or do you have a mom Chick and pop? Chick-fil-A. You have to yeah. stop there every time? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm a Chick-fil-A guy. It's hard resist. for me to drive by one. Can't resist. We're getting one in this town. Mm. I bet we eat Chick-fil-A. We do now because we have kids, and I try not to. But there was a time before I started eating carnivore, I bet we eat three, four nights a week. Really? Or days. Like, I would stop in there and get something for me, somebody, all of us. Yeah. Anyway, it's my two year old how daughter. We got off my two year old daughter is like, Chick fil A. So, Chick fil A. I'm like, okie dokie. <laughs> Only because you want it. <laughs> okay, I'll have a peach milkshake and a number one deluxe. Thank you. Uh, a large fry, two. Waffle fries, extra two Chick fil A sauce. I'm like, God, there's only one person in the car, dude. <laughs> Is there any private menu at Chick fil A? Uh, I don't you know how some of those restaurants have Yeah. Oh, yeah. In and Out does that. I'll do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I do a, a double cheeseburger at McDonald's with Big Mac sauce. I get the, I can, the, do the bacon McDouble. God, we're all so fat. At wow, our, we're not helping anybody right, right now. now. <laughs> Dude, we got we got an hour and in, and the walls came down. It's like ah, health and fitness. Nah, McDonald's anyway, Big Mac sauce. <laughs> have you ever had the McDonald's double cheeseburger with a Big Mac sauce on? That's where it's at. That's exactly where it's got me. This is what I'm talking about. I have. I said earlier, I have a very unhealthy relationship. Eighty twenty. Yes, eighty twenty. <laughs> yeah, 80/20. I mean, you do have to have because it is impossible for me to be perfect. Yeah. Even though I'm an extremist. You have to have. I like the way you're doing it. Like you got weekly yeah. goals. Yeah. Not like I can never eat chocolate again in my life. Right? Yeah. Who can? Who could literally do that? Not me. Yeah. But so, so if I was to come, up, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. I was to come up to you and say, "Now give me something generalized." I was to say, "Hey, I want to. I want to get lean. Mm-hmm. I want to stay in shape to be able to run the mountains, run a camera, climb trees, and do all that. I want to keep some strength. Yep. But I like to lose ten or fifteen pounds. Okay." What what kind of protocol Monday through Friday would you put me on? So I would put you on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday split to train. Mm-hmm. And that would be two upper body days per week and two lower body days per week. What I would do within those days is one would be lighter, higher repetition, say for upper body first. And then your second day of upper body that week is going to be a little bit more compound movement like bench press, incline dumbbells. The other is going to be more of an accessory. Mm. So same for the squat or the deadlift or whatever you did for lower body. A little bit lighter weight, more repetition kind of stuff on one day, and then more of the heavier compound like leg press, that kind of thing on the other day. Between those two days, I would say at minimum, we're going to do some kind of ruck. And I'm not talking like 50, 60 pounds. I just think of progressive five pounds every two weeks. Just start with 15, 20 pounds if you're a female. Start with like 25, 30 pounds if you're a guy. And just add five pounds a week until you get to a, a certain threshold where you feel good. But that ruck is really good for you if you want to do in the outdoors, you know, if you want to be moving around and that kind of stuff. Other stuff that I really uh, or other movements I really encourage people to do is uh, just lateral movements. Like don't just think of lunges as a straightforward movement. Lunge outward, step up outward, do lateral movements, lateral planes of movement uh, because the mountain is not straightforward and Mm, flat. Right. You know, so those kind of things. Diet, you know, diet wise, I would tell you whatever you weigh, subtract 10 percent 
and eat that much protein. So if you're 200 pounds, 220. Well, if you're 200 pounds, just say flat example, take away 10%, that's 180. You know, because most people are 10% body fat mm -hmm. or more. So mm -hmm. let's eat for the muscle. Let's not eat for the total. Got it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of focus because that's, you know, that shaves a that's few. That's a huge misconception then because everybody's right. like, oh, eat what you weigh in protein. It's yeah. Like, and and that, at some point, you know, people get into that's extra calories that they don't need. But also they start finding high protein sources that are also high fat, high carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I say protein, that is basically limited to eggs, which are the most anabolic food on the planet. There's no better protein source than an egg, I don't believe. Um, Why is that? Do you eat so a whole high egg? trans fat? Right? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I supplement the protein with whites. Mm. So like, I still think fat is like, f if you're not eating fat, you're not doing any favors to your hormones because fat is one of those things that helps balance and, and stabilize your hormones. So removing fat from your diet is a terrible thing. And I think, again, to your point, that's something that they did intentionally mm -hmm. too. So, but anyway, so I would say 10% reduction of your body weight, eat that number in protein. So 200 pound person eats 180, 180 grams of protein. I like to match my fat by half on that. So 90 grams. If it's 180, 90. If it's 200, it's 100. Little anything over that, over 100 to 120 grams. I mean, you'd have to be a big person to, to require that number. But anything over that, you start getting into some some stress of the gut. So I would say a max is like 110 grams of fat a day. Mm. But from there, then I eat carbohydrates pre pre workout and post workout only because that's when your body's going to be utilizing the glycogen the most effectively and in need of glycogen. Not necessarily need, but it'll utilize it better than any other time. So morning, I'm going to have fat and protein. Mid-morning, I'm going to have protein. Pre-workout, I'm going to have protein and carbs. Post-workout, I'm going to have protein and carbs. Dinner, I'm going to have protein and fat. Hmm. Now, that sounds like five meals a day, but my protein and carbs can be one shake split between before and after. Mm -hmm. It'll be the same shake, just a little bit bigger volume. And, you know, you drink that throughout. Mid-morning is just a, you know, couple of ounces of chicken breast mm. you know it's not like a whole meal so i don't think of that that way but that's what i would do i'd probably get you set up around three to four days of training a week three to four meals a day and i would get you drinking water at at least a gallon a day um, anything over that you can supplement with crystal light but i would tell people also put minerals in your water like sodium is so important because like if you're, if you're drinking salt. like distilled water or process like any of these mm -hmm. waters you're not storing it like that's why people keep drinking clear bottled water and they get dehydrated. Mm. You know, the minerals aren't there to balance right. it. So I hyper salt the crap out of everything because water, I mean, it's, it's water soluble. You're going to piss it out. Mm -hmm. So put it in there. And I don't believe in all the heart stress and all that stuff, unless there are other conditions. If right, you're yeah. otherwise healthy, you need salt mm -hmm. to balance out and then really benefit your body. So three days a week, three to four meals a day, um, you know, focused around protein and fat, Carbs around your workout. Make sure you're getting at minimum six and a half hours of sleep a night at minimum, because the reduction of hormone balance below six hours. I got seven hours and twelve minutes last night. Good job. I got two and a half. So, you know, do if so. I sleep seven hours, it's a miracle. I got two hours yeah. of REM. Well, I mean, of what it, REM sleep? It's like the deep sleep. Gotcha. Anyway, but like for you, I mean, my biggest concern for you and just in talking to you and stuff would be your sleep. And I, I know like you got to get after it and you've got to make stuff happen when it happens. But just as somebody that has talked to you and, and heard you say, man, I, you know, I'm tired or I need more sleep. Yeah. Like, Oh, they, they said that there's actual more debilitation to the body, the building effects, debilitating effects on the body from lack of sleep than mm. alcoholism at times. Wow. Uh, like comprehensively. Yeah. You know, cause alcohol is specific to the liver, but some of the whatever, Yeah, I don't know if that's completely accurate or not, but I do know that lack of sleep, man, it compounds other things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think you're just in the war zone right now. You got, yeah, four, you got four kids, yeah. hunting season. Yeah. Like, it ain't going to be there, but if you can get five minutes, get five minutes. Yeah, for know? sure. It's very hard for me to nap. I, I do get six to six to seven hours uh, when I'm home. Yeah. Which, for me, I think I've, I've learned to function on four hours so much. Yeah. Like, because of what I do, hunting, and just always on the go. That six or seven feels like, dude. Oh yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but then after hunting season, I come home and it's like I. It takes me a month to like, I, I just can't get enough sleep. My body's like, I get to a point where I'm like, okay, it's it's like too much. Yeah. 
But I do feel like when I'm in my health and fitness journey, like when I look my best, sleep is a big part of that. Yeah. Water has been a big part of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got to do better with my sleep for sure. That's one place that I struggle. You got a good mattress and stuff. That stuff goes so far. I mean, like some of the mattress technology. I'll tell you the other thing. Sounds crazy, but it's true. Long ways. Is this before bed? Yeah, you got to get rid of that. If you put it down and don't sit there and just. Yeah, my problem is trail cameras, dude. Oh yeah, this time of year especially. It's it's all. If it goes bink, I'm like, oh, 3 a.m. Like, who was it? Who you know? Yeah. It's terrible. I should probably just sleep in a different room, honestly. Are you? But you're a night inclined person anyway, right? Like, it, do you? Like me, I get tired, like fatigue, 7, 8 p.m., mm-hmm. 10.30 at night, 11 o'clock. Somebody said, let's put on a movie or let's sit up and talk or let's go out back and drink. Like, I'm excited by the Same. Night. Like, you know, I just mm-hmm. like being up. I love being up at night. Yeah. Yes. That's the way I am. Too. Yes. Really? Like 2 a.m.? Yeah. If I, if, I, if, if you gave me a perfect night, day, I'm up till 2, sleep till 8. Yeah. Like... Or we can go to bed. If we go to bed, it doesn't matter how tired I am. We go to bed at 10 o'clock, I ain't falling asleep at 10 o'clock. Right, that's the same. Dude, I'm sorry that me and Clay went to bed so early on you. No, I got to get my kids to bed. But I just lay there. And and my kids are like, because of me, like me and Landon will lay there and have conversations till midnight. Yeah. You know? Dude, you guys will swim till like 11 o'clock. I know, it's just us. Like, But, but that's, that's the way I am too. Yeah. As a family, we have a ton of quality time at you know, most people are like can't wait to get my beds or kids asleep. Seven thirty bedtime. I don't know how they do that. Yeah, we lay our son down at um, at eight forty five, and inevitably winds up being nine o'clock. Yeah. Our daughter goes to sleep at seven thirty on her own. Son goes to bed at eight forty five. But we we play like nonstop and do stuff mm. from five until then. But then I bet thirty minutes later, right. me and Maggie are just like, yeah, out. See, not us. Do you uh, like do you? struggle to wake up in the mornings Mm -mm. dude i'm the worst oh really it's two thirty. like all about how fired up i am every morning Mm. like if i get up to piss at 2 30 in the morning i might as well just yeah go go, just get up and stay up because it's like i am fired up when i wake up i love a morning person too yeah i'm a night person i'm a morning person i hate sleeping i I I hate napping huh i don't like napping no i I like a good sleep but i can't nap yeah like if i can go like if i can 15 minutes like doze on the couch then like mm. jerk myself up i'm good like 15 minutes yeah 30 minutes becomes four hours mm-hmm. like it either it is either i'm so tired i have to have this yeah or it's going to destroy me all day but yeah man like this morning the alarm went off at like i think i said it for 235 it went off and you know i woke up and i was like god i didn't sleep for crap like three hours or something kind of looked at my phone and i was like i'm gonna lay back down and then i laid there for two minutes i like just get up and once I got up, my feet hit the floor. Mm. I feel good. And I love that drive so much this morning, watching the sunrise coming through West Virginia and that mm-hmm. stuff. It's beautiful. So it's like, I don't know how I would feel, build a perfect day, but I'm more like you, something. If, if I could go to bed 12, 1, 2, and sleep till 7, 8, 9, mm-hmm. somewhere, like, man, that would be perfect. Yeah, that's, for per- me. that's what we do most of the time. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean... <clears throat> It's hunting season, so sleep is kind of out the window at this point. But what else you got coming up? Leave for Nebraska Sunday, me and Joe. Okay. Well, by the time this airs, that will have already happened. So hopefully we kill one. But oh, it'll be something yeah. good, I'm sure. Yeah. Speaking of food, Samantha's got supper uh, ready. You got to drive back. Yeah. Or you're welcome to hang here as long as you want. Um, but dude, I know it's a long drive for you. I just want to say thanks for coming. Oh, dude, it's like I told you, man. You know, every time I've been around you, I've, I've left very appreciative, but also doors have opened in different ways right you know and, and it's like it's not about that but yeah dude it's it's never a thing to ask just, well just let me know and i'll come yeah for my first time i've just enjoyed being around you and listening and learning and um so thanks again for coming i guess we'll go eat supper <laughs> and uh figure out the rest of that no night. no pie oh it's, it's she's making the pie bud <laughs> today is that day <laughs> yes <Pie. laughs> all right guys thank you thank you guys